Good afternoon and welcome to our third and last keynote lecture of the Cultural Memory of Past Dictatorships seminar series. A warm welcome to those of you who joined us for the first time, for those who have been with us here before, and to all of our participants to the symposium that will follow this seminar series. My name is Diana Popa and I am a postdoctoral research fellow with the Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past in the Global Arena project based at Tallinn University in Estonia. Together with Dr. Guido Bartolini from University College Cork, Ireland, we are the curators of a series of keynote lectures and a symposium that aim to explore the cultural memory of dictatorships across the globe with a specific focus on questions of complicity and responsibility, which we would like to raise by engaging with Michael Rodberg's con concept of implication and its attendant figure, the implicated subject. The seminar series started with Professor Michael Lazara's talk, which was followed by Professor Juliane Prade-Weiss's talk last week. The recordings are available on the Cultural Memory of Past Dictatorships YouTube channel. This seminar series will be followed by the symposium on May 19th and 20th. And this series of events is generally support, generously supported by our sponsor, uh, sponsors the Irish Research Council, the National University of Ireland, the Centre for Advanced Studies at University College Cork, and the ERC project Translating Memories, the Eastern European Past in the Global Arena, funded by the European Research Council under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. Today, I have the honour and the pleasure to introduce to you our third keynote speaker, David Martin Jones, who is Professor of Film Studies at the University of Glasgow. Previously, Professor Martin Jones worked at the University of St. Andrews, the institution I got my PhD from and where I first encountered David's rich and varied research agenda. David's work explores the question of what it means to study a world of cinemas. He interrogates the intersection between cinema and philosophical issues like time, identity, ethics, ecology, and attention. He is the author and editor of nine books, including Deleuze and World Cinemas, which came out in 2011, and more recently, Cinema Against Double Think, 2018, a book in which he uncovers how a world of cinemas acts as a giant, as a giant archive of the lost, forgotten, censored, and disappeared past of world history, in other words, as a vast virtual store of the world's memories. Professor Martin Jones is the co-editor of the Bloomsbury monograph series, Thinking Cinema, and of the online research resource, DeleuzeCinema.com. He's also a member of several editorial boards, including Deleuze and Guattari studies, film philosophy, and transnational screens. His talk today is entitled, Remembering Cold War Pasts Across a World of Cinemas. Professor Martin Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diana. What a lovely and warm welcome. I really appreciate it. Uh, bringing back lots of uh, very fond memories, especially of meeting yourself at St Andrews. Uh, for anyone who is sitting there a little bit terrified at all the Deleurs, uh, rest assured, I don't think I'll be speaking about Deleurs at all today. Perhaps he's in the background somewhere. Okay, so I shall start. Uh, my thank you to Diana and Guido for this kind invitation to participate in a fascinating conference. I've enjoyed the two keynotes we've, we've heard so far very much indeed, and I hope I can add something uh, different again to give us more things to talk about at the symposium itself. I hope I might offer a prompt for later discussion around one of the key terms of the event's subtitle, Global Perspectives or perhaps rather I mean global perspective, singular, or a singular with a plural somehow, in the sense that we may talk about world or global history as a singular, but we know we're talking about many histories, or world systems and the various ways we can think about that, all different ways of describing a totality of sorts. So the, I'm trying to get, here we go, the focused case study that I'm going to look at today will be the Chinese documentary Hu Jie's Though I Am Gone from 2006. This is a film about the legacy of China's cultural revolution. And so here I am talking more about the state of exception per se than I am about a Cold War dictatorship in the sense that we might think of, say, Chile or South Korea, just to name two examples and many more. 
um, the Cultural Revolution being rather unusual, even perhaps for the Cold War. But I will be exploring essentially how implicated uh, filmmakers and to an extent the viewers can be in recording the past or rather in retelling the lost pasts of world history. So uh, just to add a little bit of depth to uh, Diana's lovely introduction, I'm going to spend a little bit of time setting up the analysis of this documentary by introducing some broader questions first. This is less about my vanity of explaining my intellectual project honestly, um, but I'll try and so I'll try and do it very, very briefly, but it's more about making sense of the conclusions that I draw at the end, which if I just do them with the one documentary won't make a lot of sense, but if I do them with the bigger arena, hopefully they will. Okay. So a nice colorful slide, pick out your, your favorite film there. I work in an interdisciplinary area called film philosophy, and I use the ideas like Gilles Deleuze from Continental Philosophy, amongst others, um, but also a Latin American philosopher called Enrique Dussel quite a lot. Uh, Dussel, um, famous for talking about um, colonial modernity, also famously addressed by Mignolo and others. I examine world cinema, a term which I know to be problematic, um, potentially orientalizing like world cinema or world food, and which I've tried to reconfigure with the phrase, a world of cinemas. It's a bit unwieldy, but I'm following people like Lucy and Ajib from 2006, I'm trying to think about a sort of a horizontal playing field of, of world cinemas without singular origin or, um, or center. What I try and do as part of the transnational turn, I often explore similarities between films from different contexts, especially across Latin America, specifically the Southern Cone in that sense, and also various East and Southeast Asian cinemas. So there's big holes in my coverage of a world of cinemas, in particular in terms of African cinemas, um, but one can only do so much. Um, these aesthetic similarities that I find between these films though are, I think, quite telling, uh, especially when they emerge from very different contexts. As part of this research, I have looked at the history of the Cold War as it emerges across various different documentaries from different countries. And this is only one dimension of a broader project which looks to shift our focus from how national cinemas can portray national histories to how different filmmakers may engage with histories bigger or longer than those of the nation. Histories like that of, say, the planet uh, or the Anthropocene, and there are other ways of doing that as well. And this has taken me away from some of the established ideas like those of prosthetic or post-memory, ideas of how the past may be reclaimed, whether attached like a prosthesis or even just reconstructed, to consider instead how film stage encounters for us with pasts which are lost and cannot be reclaimed. This distinction is quite important for today. Not pasts which we can attach or recreate, but pasts which are shown to us something we cannot know because they're gone. You will note the title of the documentary today is Though I Am Gone. And the point of these films doing this, I have argued, is to remind us of the relative nature of the history which informs our present and of the myriad alternative pasts which have been lost. And as an aside, if you look at the slide here, you've got three faces facing you from the past. And the importance of the face is quite important here, I think. In these films, the encounter with the lost past is often staged as an encounter with an extinct species or a legend or an exterminated indig indigeneity, or maybe even the very earth itself, which is somehow making a mouthpiece to speak to us. So in a sense, what I'm talking about here is a Levinasian or maybe really a, a Dusselian ethics involved in the way we encounter uh, the lost pasts of the world, something which can shake us out of our complacency, both in terms of our relationship with others as a Levinasian ethics would, but also historically with regard to the structural inequality of colonial modernity, which is what a Dusselian ethics can give, which a Levinasian ethics does not. And so that's if you're into that kind of thing, that's a very brief sense of what's sitting behind the paper I'm going to give today. I've called this Cinema Against Doublethink, referencing the Orwellian idea of how history is written as a singular linearity, the official story of history, if you like, even against our, our experience of it being more multiple than that. And nowadays, when we talk about fake news, we're in this very similar territory. So this is, I think, the area in which I can offer something of interest to this symposium. I found that when cinemas of the world address how we remember the recent Cold War past, challenging question emerges. 
do these films suggest that the emergence of the state of exception in many contexts from the 60s and the 70s onwards was a situation specific to the Cold War? Or do they in fact indicate something more pertinent to our era of neoliberalism's increasingly ambivalent relationship with democracy? This is not a question that I have an answer to. Even so, I do not offer this as a kind of empty provocation so much as I think of it as well, honestly, as a sort of terrifying, but possibly very real thought. And we heard last week from Julianne, very enjoyable paper on neoliberalism and authoritarianism. And I think we find ourselves in a similar terrain today. This is something which exploring a world of cinemas can help us reflect upon, even if it cannot help us to solve it, as it were. Popular culture, of course, is way ahead of us in visualizing such an idea as indicated on the slide. But just briefly, what would prompt such dark questioning? I have three reasons. Firstly, I take quite seriously anthropologist Yonick Kwan's contention that in some parts of the world, the Cold War is still decomposing. This seems evident in certain films from different parts of the world. On the one hand, if we look at, say, Latin American cinemas, we find attempts to engage with the Cold War past as something that is historically past even if the ripples continue. So here's just one example, some apparent films from Argentina. I suspect people will have seen one of these at least. Azor is quite recent and uh, fascinating, but also quite horrifying. On the other hand though, other films seem much more in line with Kwan's contention that in some places the Cold War is only decomposing. For example, we're talking about complicity and implication and so on. In Joshua Oppenheimer's films, and let's remember they are by Oppenheimer and often other directors, uh, Christine Sin is one of the directors uh, acknowledged, but also anonymous, whose name has been kept anonymous for their safety. So I'm going to say Oppenheimer, but let's remember that these are co often co-directed co works. In The Look of Silence from 2014 and The Act of Killing from 2012, we palpably feel the fact that the Cold War lingers on in Indonesia. I expect a lot of people have seen one of these films at least, but if not, The Act of Killing is a startling documentary in which former Death Squad members make movies about their multiple murders in the past. It's received significant academic coverage, and I'll not go over that again today, but we could perhaps consider such films in terms of Michael Rothberg's implicated subjects to some extent. But in truth, these films tend to draw a rather clear distinction between perpetrators and, well, Rothberg says victims. I'm, I'm not clear myself if we should be saying victims or survivors. I appreciate sometimes victims aren't survivors. Um, but let's go with perpetrators and victims. But somehow in my head, I'm wondering about survivors. These films interrogate the present day reality in which the perpetrators of human rights abuses in the past remain in power. The children of their victims still live in fear. And what is at stake in their interaction is how the, his the story of history is told. So here is my point again about cinema against double think. The act of killing illustrates what Charles W. Mills would describe in the racial contract as how the global history is rewritten in an Orwellian manner. It is noticeable that the former death squad gangsters in the story reference the US Western in the way that reminds us of this. They question whether what they did and their desire to make movies about it is any different from what the USA did to its indigenous peoples as celebrated in Westerns. So in these films, an ongoing Cold War in which the truth of history is at stake. Second reason, which underpins the question of whether the state of emergency is a growing trend, relates to the idea of the third wave. I join many, I think, in disagreeing with Samuel Huntington's idea of the third wave, which he proposed in 1991, arguing that the world was moving gradually towards democracy as the Cold War closed. It is possible to disagree with this for various reasons, but not least is that some of the countries which Huntington believed to be transitioning to democracy were in actual fact transitioning back to democracy, democracy re-emerging really after being interrupted by US foreign policy. So as we are experiencing in the present moment in many countries, including certainly in the UK, I think also in the USA, we might say democratic rights seem to be, democratic rights seem to be under attack uh, in, in certain subtle or not so subtle ways. And then the third reason, I'm influenced by the ideas of scholars critiquing neoliberalism who indicate its closeness to the state of exception. Most apparent here is um, Giorgio Agamben, I would say that's the pre-pandemic Agamben at least, 
who argues that the emergence of the state of exception at various times in the 20th century is evidence of an ongoing global civil war. We can add Achilles M. Bembe, who observes in NECA politics the planetary renewal of colonial relations and the global scale creation of the state of exception. Again, we have Capital Hates Everyone, perhaps the best title for an academic book ever thought of by Maurizio Lazzarato, discussing how we live in a period of blurring of hybridization of the state of law and the state of exception. No doubt colleagues here will have other examples which we can talk about as well. Tellingly, for this discussion, of how the state of exception alters the past, Lazzarato notes how neoliberalism has succeeded in erasing from the memory, the action and the theory of the forces combating capitalism, which brings us back to these documentaries in the past which they confront us with. What we often find in such films is the idea of the personal museum of memory upholding cultural memory, the private archive standing in for what was officially disappeared from the official record of the past during the state of exception. That is the notion that when a state sets out to erase a political opposition within its own borders and then to erase its own actions in this respect from the past, a bulwark against this Orwellian rewriting of history in the state of exception remains in the memories and private archives of individuals. So I'm just going to talk briefly about what Julianne mentioned last week, and she wasn't speaking about her own work, but representing another position. Um, the position that the turn to memory and its fragmentation uh, might be considered a consequence of the polarizing of society under neoliberalism and the normalizing of capitalism as kind of the only option, capitalist realism, if you like. And here I think they're in a world of cinemas in these documentaries that we can find, uh, yes, a degree of that, but also a, a slight way to help us think about it with some different nuances. Bearing in mind when saying that, that a, a venerable figure of uh, writing about documentary, Michael Chenan, has argued that the documentaries shift from a kind of objective subject matter to much more subjective subject matter, which, which probably happened in lifetimes of someone like myself, has increasingly enabled it to engage the personal with the political. So a, a very helpful example of this is the Uruguayan documentary. So I expect not many people have seen this, although there will be some papers on Uruguay at symposium, which I hope I can attend. A helpful example of this is the Uruguayan documentary by Juan Alvarez Neme called Al Pie del Arbol Blanco at the foot of the white tree from 2007. This is about the recovery of photos taken by a photographer, Aurelio Gonzalez, who worked for the communist paper El Popular, which was shut down by the government in 1973. Gonzalez went into exile, but on his return, sought out his photos. So although this is an archive of a now closed newspaper, it's Gonzalez's personal search which we learn about his personal memory his investment in his photographic archive and how it can reinform a broader cultural memory and in the end he donated the archive to the people of Uruguay so such documentaries this is just one example construct personal audiovisual museums of memory on screen and they try to show us these lost pasts in spite of the absence of footage which actually shows that these are some of the photos from that era which were recovered and which the film gives us access to. And if you visit Uruguay's Museum of Memory after seeing this film, you will find that several of the images of that time on display are from Gonzalez's archive. Perhaps if they hadn't have found the archive, they would still have had those other images, but it's, it's telling that some of the biggest images put up in the museum are from that, that lost archive. These images surround artifacts which otherwise indicate how little is left to memorialize that past. For example, a striking and very memorable part of the exhibit was a prison door suspended from the ceiling to represent incarceration. Its very abstractness indicates the lost nature of its former context and perhaps more terrifying, the disappearance of the captives it once held. So personal memories and private archives then to counter the eradication of alternative pasts in the state of exception, the personal still having the power to inform the, the public. Of course, not all films do this in the same way. Michael uh, already gave us excellent examples from Chile, which do things differently, and I'm sure there are others again. In terms of Rothberg on implication, in fact, we might also think of slightly different documentaries. This is uh, uh, Rithi Pan's S21, The Khmer Rouge Killing Machine from 2003, which is, again, a very challenging film to watch, in which all of those who survived these Cambodian death camps can negotiate their implication in the atrocities they witnessed or committed. But in general, the tensions being explored seem to be between the ability of the state of exception to eradicate the past and the ability of the individual to uphold 
the memory of a different past, typically one in which some individuals felt that they belonged more to collectives. So that's the trend as I see it from my viewing and some exceptions to show that there is a trend, I suppose. And then to focus for today, part of this trend and standing out from it, and that is crucial for implication. It is similar, but it does stand out from some like at the foot of the white tree because of the nuances and the complexities which are quite different and the way we move from yeah perpetrators and victims or survivors and to um oh how do we understand the the sides as it were in this version of history huge a's though i am gone stands out because it adds a greater degree of complexity in terms of implication though i am gone documents one man's preservation of a private archive of materials evidencing his wife's death during China's Cultural Revolution. Wang, Ying, Wang Jingyao maintains his archive in the face of the way official state history has been constructed and preserved during and after the state of exception of the Cultural Revolution. So a very brief caveat just to get it out of the way and save us the questions. Um, the extent to which we can call the, the Cultural Revolution a state of exception is complex. Uh, if we dig into it, counter arguments emerge you could say it's not a state of exception actually because it was one of many such purges that went on you know quasi continuously you could say it's not a state of exception actually because it is consistent with the policy of preparedness for invasion whether from the soviets from the north or the usa coming up through vietnam therefore we move all the industry to the center of the country and put everyone on a war footing by you know mobilizing the red guard and so on so yes you you could you can say it's not a state of exception but on balance, it seems fair due to the suspension of the rule of law at the time. Also, you can dig into other things like the carnival-like nature of what went on and that kind of thing. But we'll go with it for now. It's a state of exception for the sake of argument. OK, this is a, a harrowing documentary, and I've chosen this time that I'm presenting on it not to show a clip for that reason. In the past, I've done it, and it's, it's been quite difficult to talk about it. But we can still talk about it without a clip, I think. It confronts us, it confronts us with a double dilemma. Firstly, it challenges us to consider the degree of clarity we can gain from such works of cultural memory preservation. And this is again about that global perspective and can we ever get one? How much of a local political big picture are we able to discern and thus how much can we grasp possible implication or complicity? Secondly, what do the nuanced complexities of a world of cinema indicate about how much of the big picture of world history we are able to comprehend? Are we able to understand a global perspective? I will, I will primarily look at the first of these in relation to though I am gone, and I'll briefly touch on the second at the end because you kind of inevitably end up at the second question. The answer I'm going to give to the first question is, it is complicated. Perhaps we can only see as much as the filmmakers allow us to see. And this may itself depend on how much we can be assumed to already know as viewers. And that's the answer really to the second question. It depends. So the answer to the first question, it's complicated. The answer to the second, it depends. So you can tell, of course, that I'm academic and I'm not used to finding simple answers to complex questions. I'm not a politician. Um, but more seriously, two things. Firstly, it is complicated. It seems to me what we learn from Rothberg or what I did, at least. I was struck. I was kind of halted in the middle of reading by an example he gives. And I won't mention the context, but he talks about different contexts and implication, how to compare situations where there are few implicated but many beneficiaries with others where there are many implicated but few beneficiaries. And that stopped me for ages thinking, well, that's how do we talk about that then? So the complexity, it seems, is contextual. Contextual, or at least it is to a degree. I'm not going to say if it's a large degree, people will know that better than me. But to my mind, it seems to be when I'm thinking about films from around the world, which I might be able to see. Secondly, again for why it's more serious than me just sort of dodging a question as you can perhaps already tell from these answers it's complicated it depends it's the working through it's the realization of what we cannot know which is more important and that's what's going to bring me back to these lost pasts and what we can say about about them so surrounding these films about lost pasts are our deficiencies in relation to what we can ever know of these pasts right though i am gone though i am Gone explores a historical injustice, a murder committed during the Cultural Revolution for which the Red Guard perpetrators have never been brought to trial. Beijing school teacher Biang Zhongyong was killed by her students in August 1966. Biang was the vice principal of the girls' middle school attached to the Beijing Normal University, 
and she was also the party secretary. The school's students included many children of very influential party members. The death of Bian is well known in China and a topic of public debate in the ensuing decades. Hu Jie's documentary is banned in China, although it's been widely viewed on the internet, sometimes goes under other names on YouTube and places like that, uh, although I am gone or though I was dead. So though I am gone focuses on Bian's grieving widower, Wang, who has preserved the evidence and the memory of his wife's brutal murder in the hope that it may one day be officially brought to trial. Failing that, he notes, it might inform an official museum of memory to victims of the Cultural Revolution. Wang preserved events using a camera that he bought the day after Bian's death, and he states that he did this because he was, quote, determined to record the truth of history, or at least that's the quote of the translation in the subtitles, determined to record the truth of history. So please just hang on to that fact that Wang bought a camera the day after the death of his wife, determined to record the truth of history. The documentary incorporates many of Wang's photographs from the aftermath of his wife's murder. Accordingly, the academic uh, consensus is that the film constructs something of a personal archive, so very much in line with what I was saying before about the, the broader trend for uh, documentaries about the Cold War. So there's several examples. I'll just pick out the keywords. Alternative archive, virtual museum of forbidden memory, um, political gesture of resistance against deliberate amnesia. So what's interesting I find here is that we find films from, we, we could use those terms to talk about Latin American documentaries, several of them. So it's quite interesting to me to see these connections. Indeed, the film works up to its standout moment in which Wang opens up his personal archive of material objects relating to Bian and her death in particular, which he's not touched for decades. And as I say, it's very harrowing, so I've chosen not to show it today. Um, but the archive includes the bloodstained clothes Bian was wearing when she was beaten to death. It also includes Wang's photographs, documents, the testimony of other witnesses and survivors, and other artifacts preserved for nearly four decades, such as these two watches. And I'll come back to these two watches in a minute. Together, these objects resemble exhibits at a trial, really, or, yeah, something like that, or maybe a museum exhibition, it's true. They also indicate materially that Wang's personal memory exists in the folds within official history as they're literally packed away in his home. So we might be tempted then, especially on first viewing, to see Though I Am Gone as a straightforward story of justice denied, and that was my understanding of it when I first watched it. However, whilst it focuses on individual memory and a personal archive as a bulwark against Orwellian state denial, and whilst it seems to establish a perpetrator and survivor or victim, uh, perpetrator and victim binary, in fact, it contains much within it which asks us to consider implication and its complexities. Wang and his wife had been, so we start to get their backstory, and that's what's interesting. Wang and his wife had been, the documentary reveals, local party members through the Sino Japanese War and the Civil War before they attained the roles they had when the Cultural Revolution erupted. Wang's familial history, the majority of the photographs are of a family unit, demonstrate that his grievance may be as much about Bian's murder as it is about the injustice of the betrayal of the history of the party and the national history constructed by it, which they had previously worked for Wang and Bian as revolutionaries. So put simply, if you watch attentively, if you watch attentively, or if you watch repeatedly, I suppose, which is when I started to realize it, the, the binary becomes more complex than perpetrator survivor or victim. But what it means in terms of implication is also complex. Let's have a look at those watches again. During the film's emotive last minutes, when Wang opens the suitcase of Bian's personal effects, he removes a wristwatch. Its hands stopped, we are led to infer, during Bian's violent beating in 1966. Almost immediately afterwards, an old fashioned fob watch is produced from the suitcase, a different watch, which Bian inherited from, his, from her stepmother. This watch, Wang informs us, was used in 1947 during the Civil War by the Xinhua News Agency and the Shanbei radio station. This was then based in the Taihan mountain region after the communist withdrawal from Yenan. So here it gets very complex and about Chinese history and so on. But the fob watch at the time enabled the time to be announced to the communist troops over the radio. 
And in the same climactic um, section of the film, Wang shows to the camera Bian's Battlefield Service Group badge. And Wang also, when prompted by the director Hu, notes Bian's love of certain songs popular from the Sino-Japanese War, such as the Ode to Yellow River and On the Taihan Mountain. And as he recounts how Bian sang the latter song in 1947 in the Taihan Mountain region, the music is heard on the soundtrack. So I say it all gets a bit involved in history, but the interpretation of the scene, if you unpack it, seems fairly clear, I think. The violence unleashed by the Cultural Revolution against such loyal party members stopped the clock as it were, on the history of their service to the party, delegitimizing their personal narrative of political history. And this is a kind of history of, of the, the very various interpretations of the Cold War by different historians, but Paul J. Bailey understands the Cultural Revolution to be just this, if you like. The history that was attacked during the Cultural Revolution, now memorialized only in the private lives of family members of deceased victims, and banned films like that of Though I Am Gone, was that of another road or roads for the revolution that stemmed from the Yan'an uh, period. So how then to understand this documentary in terms of implication? There is more to this, but for our focus today, there are several interlinked unanswered questions which we are left with when watching the film. What experiences in the biographical past of the loyal party member led Wang to purchase the camera the day after his wife's death? Why did he record her corpse as one would a body in a crime scene? How, does it, how did his experience of political history prior to the Cultural Revolution inform his decision making? And these kinds of questions start to arise when you think about it, if you watch the film a second time, really, and you're not so taken along in the narrative. And through such questioning, the nature of the injustice which Wang feels is here rendered more complex because he is integral to the context. And so, as I said at the top, I think that this is the point where we might consider implication to be very complicated when it comes to how a world of cinemas explore such momentous past moments. What the documentary illustrates is how entwined the personal and the public, the private and the political are. And this is true both in the historical moment and in the recording of history. At the opening of the film, Wang's photographs of his happy, smiling family are suddenly juxtaposed by the insertion of a picture of four men apparently about to be executed by communist forces. So we see this image first, happy, smiling family, then the montage directly gives us this one. This is the key moment for our discussion today, I think. It shows vividly how intertwined the personal archive can be with the public and the political. Wang took this in the countryside whilst participating in the four cleanups movement after his graduation from the Central Party School in 1965. And Wang is very clear in the documentary that he decided he wanted to be a revolutionary and so did Bian and, and yes, that was his life. But when you think about why did he buy the camera, why did he do what he did, and what was his personal history, we get these questions again. So does Wang's involvement in such cleanups explain why he bought the camera? It might do. Was he involved in similar beatings or even executions to that which happened to his wife? I don't know. It's hard to tell from the film itself. The film doesn't tell you. This is why, as I say, understanding implication in a world of cinemas is very complicated. Perhaps all we can say is that Wang knew enough from experience to create an archive with which to seek justice in a time yet to come, a time during which its images would contrast with the propaganda-like images of the era, images then with which to later challenge or reimagine or re-aestheticize the past. In this particular documentary, we find what Elizabeth Jenin observes, memories which survive in the private sphere with the potential to later reinform the public may rarely form a single coherent counter-narrative to the official story of history. Rather, we see here in line with Jelin that various individual experiences of the past create multiple social and political viewpoints. Accordingly, what is explored in Though I Am Gone is not so much private memory against public silence, rather to follow Jelin, it is memory against memory. This might explain, I think, how in a world of cinemas, the intertwined nature of the private past and the official story of the public past creates such complexity around implication. And this is, I think, the point I can hopefully offer here. So I shall say it again. Memory against memory may explain how, in a world of cinemas, the intertwined nature of the private past with the official story of the public past creates complexity around implication. Are we back with the position which Julianne helpfully outlined for us that such atomized memories help maintain the capitalist status quo. In terms of a world of cinemas, 
specifically, just thinking about world cinema, yes and no. Yes, because it's memory against memory. So yes, but no, also because it, it does counter the singular view of all history. The world of cinemas creates quite a clamour of memories of lost pasts after all, a point I shall return to at the end. So how much can we grasp of implication? Well, it depends to a great extent on what the film chooses to reveal to the viewer and how it frames it. The act of killing or the look of silence, for example, seem much more clear cut in their distinctions between two sides who are at odds over the recording of history. In Though I Am Gone, things seem much more entwined. In fact, we see only one perspective really, which we might, might perhaps consider that of an implicated subject, but even that we cannot say for sure whether it, what level of implication are we talking about? Because to use the passive, which we British love so much, we are not given to know. So our second question arises. Uh, we have to also acknowledge that along with what the film chooses to reveal and how it frames it is what the viewer may already know. Exactly how much can be appreciated of the historical nuance in the encounter with a film like Though I Am Gone, considering the immensity of world history, which is represented in the world of cinemas. For those more familiar with the historical incident, including audiences in, in China, if they're able to view the film, that is, much in Though I Am Gone may seem may not seem to need to be stated explicitly, even if for a viewer like myself, it might need to be. For example, and this is interesting, I think, the documentary includes footage of a famous scene at the Tiananmen Square rally in which a young Red Guard, Song Bingbing, famously put a Red Guard armband on Chairman Mao. He famously inquired after her name and when she told him, he remarked that it would have been better. And then this is about interpretation of Chinese terms, which is a bit difficult to talk about, but he sort of said it would have been better if it were want arms or sometimes translated as be violent, um, which is <laughs> interpreted by many as a legitimizing call to violence, propelling the murderous excesses which would follow. All right, so in a way, you know, big deal, it's historical footage, you know, showing you the incitement of the Red Guard by, by Mao. And in the documentary, this is presented for the uninitiated, like someone like me, as this kind of contextualizing evidence you often find with found footage. But for those with some knowledge of the events themselves, there is a much more direct link evident. At the center of the controversy surrounding who killed Bian is precisely Song Bin Bin, who was a leading Red Guard at the girls' school. The incident with the armband occurred 12 days after the death of Bian, the two events becoming linked to the presence of Song and the increased violence which soon followed. The insertion of this footage may be intended for viewers aware of this much more granular level of history of Chinese uh, society to imply that the Cultural Revolution cleared a path for the social advancement of the elite's children at the expense of loyal party members. And that's the kind of position or interpretation of that period of the past given by someone like Lin T. White III. But amidst the vast maelstrom of films from a world of cinemas, how many potential viewers will know of this specific controversy, whether viewers elsewhere like me or perhaps even for people in China itself? Depending on the viewer, the documentary may be all that they can know of this history, and even that will be patchily understood without more in-depth research. What the encounter with Though I Am Gone reveals then is the ability of cinema to indicate, even if tacitly, its inability to fully represent the world and its histories. The, in the ability of cinema to indicate, even if tacitly, its inability to fully represent the world and its histories. As I noted at the start, we're discussing uh, the, lost, the lost paths of a world which cinema can allude to against Orwellian doublethink. These past, in the case of the documentaries, were lost during a state of exception. So we are back with a question that I cannot answer, or not with a world of cinemas, at least. We do not seem to be able to grasp a global perspective due to how entwined histories are and how implicated the people who remember the past are in its retelling. This seems equally true whether the histories involved are constructed through a perpetrator-survivor binary, perpetrator-victim binary, or in terms of implication. So in either case, I think, there is so much that we do not know that you, you just cannot tell a global perspective. What this indicates for our contemporary era of neoliberalism's reduction of democratic rights in terms of what a world of cinema does, and as Diana helpfully outlined, I think that we understand the world of cinemas 
in a kind of Deleuze, there he is again, Deleuze-ish way as a virtual archive of the world's memories. What I think in terms of what a world cinema does is that it can keep alive the realization only of our inability to know not in the sense of a failing or a saltifying cognitive dissonance of the kind that Bruno Latour identifies in the right-wing climate change denial, not that kind of, I don't know, I'm confused, but more in the sense of a reminder which creates a kind of hesitation. The past is gone, so you don't know. It's complicated, so you don't know. It depends what is seen and how much you know, so you don't know. Not knowing, or at least hesitancy, over what can be known to keep alive the realization that there is something other than what the official story tells us. Hesitancy, which may help us to relearn the past. And for those into this kind of thing, that would be like a Deleuzean time image, or as people like uh, Elia Arsaj have argued uh, how using a Bergsonian idea of time, you can think about relearning ingrained patterns, perhaps even relearning ideas, um, which might have um, an impact on your ability to understand race in a different way or something like that. So hesitancy to help us think differently about the past, relearn perhaps even ourselves and think about the future in a different way. That is at any rate to finish as much hope as I am able to muster in the current context. In terms of a world of cinemas, what can it offer us? I think a chance to think against double think, but as I say, it's complicated. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, David. I was just for a moment lost here in the, <laughs> in the, <laughs> in the format of the Zoom screen. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, your talk. Thank you very much. Very rich, lots of excellent film examples. And indeed, we've only seen a few and we're lucky if we've seen those. Um, I really like the fact that you mentioned, I was wondering before you started uh, your talk, like how many people watched this film in China? It's interesting to find out that it's been banned. So before we start the discussion, it's just a short reminder for anybody who would like to ask questions, feel free to use the raise hand function or just post it in the chat. I'm happy to take them from there as well. And yes, please go ahead. Um, let's, let's have a nice conversation. <laughs> Juliana, would you like to start please? I think Guido was first. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I was tempted maybe, to... Maybe was first, but I'm happy for you to ask and I'm happy for anyone else to get involved before I ask the question. So please go ahead. Yes, so thank you very much for, for this presentation. Uh, although I'm, I'm shamefully unaware of all things film, I must admit, uh, I was uh, tempted to ask a question given that you were so kind as to reference my uh, humble talk. Um, uh, it is interesting that you came back to my provocative uh, uh, private memory just supports neoliberalism. Of course, that's not everything I would say about also literary narratives. I basically include that because uh, in the field of literary studies, especially trauma studies, uh, I feel um, many people are sometimes naive to think that there's only one way these memories can be used. That's why so I'm not hardwired with the binarity and I'm, I'm glad you made that a bit more difficult for us and complex. I wanted to ask a question. I'm, I'm not sure if, com if the term and uh, the complication of um, a comparative approach is a thing in your field, but it is, I know, very much in my field. And um, you uh, briefly made reference to um, a narrative saying, well, is this really different from the US violence used? Um, I hope you can recall the comment. Oh, yes, uh, I'm with you, yes. Yeah, and I, I wanted to ask you if how, so given that I'm interested majorly in my project in uh, justifications of violence and mass violence, there seems to be something like, we also see that in, in discussions about Ukraine, what one could call like a comparative relativization 
uh, saying, <clears throat> I, I don't know, that's not very British, but that's how I'm able to uh, pronounce it, saying that, well, those people did it too. Is this, are we doing something that's really worse than, you know, the CIA or the US troops or whatever, uh, whoever uh, did in, say, Iraq? And, and I, I'm, uh, of course, it's easy to uh, refute this kind of uh, excuse and say, well, just because you're not as bad doesn't make the things you do good. But still, it kind of bugs me how that is related to the comparative approach I'm using. Um, do you find any such relation, or uh, maybe I'm just too sensitive, but um, so the, the comparative global approach seems to be also hijacked by people from the darker side. Uh, do you see any such relation? No, I don't, I don't know. I think um, what's interesting is that that, that um, parallel, let's say, or comparison is given by these death squad gangsters in the movie. Mm -hmm. so, so they want to try and excuse themselves and excuse the film. The film is, I'm sure a lot of people have seen this as kind of an art hit, art house hit and circulated around the, the independent cinema chains. It's, it's a surreal film to watch because it's people making genre movie snippets about their previous acts of mass murder. So it's horrid and you're there aghast. Well, most people, I think, you know, are aghast. And that's the idea you're supposed to be. And then when they say that, suddenly it's, it's, it stops you in your aghastness because you think they have a point. You know, we've read uh, Show Out and Stam from 1992, 1994, and thinking Eurocentrism, and they talk about how the US Western, you know, turns history on its head and uh, ex uh, extermination of indigenous people is shown in a certain way. And yes, and they have a point. It's exactly that. And yet I've grown up with that, and I've always thought that was good fun. Um, so there's something there uh, which is very difficult to, to, to assimilate, to deal with, I think. So I don't think I've answered your question in any way. Um, I think, what would I say? Well, I, yeah, I, I think when it comes to film, no one's particularly innocent because it's all an act of framing, isn't it? Thank you. No, that is an answer. You see the thing too. So yeah. I'm relieved. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, if Guido is happy, I would like to invite uh, Michael Lazara to ask the question. Great, thanks. Thanks so much. It was a great, great talk, David. Really enjoyed it. And I was looking back to the beginning of what you were saying, and uh, you know, thinking about some of your theoretical inspirations and and things that you mentioned. And one of the reference in the references in there was uh, was Agamben and the and the state of exception. And I was thinking in particular about Remnants of Auschwitz, uh, which was a book that was really, uh, you know, really impacted me long ago when I, when I first read it. And I was thinking about that, for example, and some of the earlier reflections and trauma studies about the impossibilities of knowing fully uh, certain traumatic pasts as, as being potentially very influential on, on kind of your, the, the way you're approaching cinema, it's in a different context, but I was thinking about, you know, essentially Agamben's book was a gloss on uh, the experience and the writings of Primo Levi. And really fundamental to that was the idea that at the heart of all testimony, uh, the, the, there's an impossibility of, of fully bearing witness to the experience because the only one who witnessed it fully was the one who's no longer there to tell the story. Um, uh, you know, that's, uh, and so essentially what he says is in all testimony or in all, you know, the, all of these attempts to access violent past, there's an essential lacuna that can never be filled. Um, and to some extent, when I was talking about autobiography as well, the autobiographical gesture and some of these documentaries from Chile, you know, the, there's this kind of inability to know at play uh, as, as well in the, in the sense that the self can never fully know itself uh, either. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the theoretical reflections on autobiography pick up on that. So my, my question is just, to, you know, kind of what, what other theoretical inspirations are behind, you know, do those early reflections in trauma theory kind of inform your reading? 
Um, and then I was also just wondering kind of more broadly about the idea of a lost past, you know, kind of what, what constitutes a lost past, um, you know, kind of in the initial conceptualization of what you're, what you're discussing. Because in some sense, all pasts are lost, uh, as, as you're mentioning. But is there some kind of particular brand of lost past that's inspiring the, your approach? Oh, that, that's a great question. Again, thank you. Another one. Okay, so um, when you started talking about Auschwitz, and I, I, I went into a, an answer to a, a different question, so I kind of, and then I realized that wasn't what you're saying, so I got, I got a bit stuck in that, you know, neuro uh, loop there. Um, yeah, that lacuna that can never be filled, and what am I, what, what's, in, what's informing me to, to get me to think about this? So, in terms of a film studies answer, it's very film studies 101. I'm sorry about this, but it is true. Um, it was the films and not the theories. Um, I'd been searching around to do something that wasn't Deleuzean for ages and trying to sort of um, break out of that. This was going back to about 2010 now. And I'd read a lot of Latin American philosophy to try and find something that I thought would help me. And I ended up with, with Dussel and then from there, Quijano and Mignolo. And so they, they really influenced me and colonial modernity. Um, and just, you know, to go back to what Julianne was talking about, when we talk about the Western and, and, you know, this rewriting of the past, where we are talking about colonial modernity again, aren't we really? So I think not the essential lacuna that can never be filled. I think that came from watching the films, watching films like, uh, Uncle Boon me and just trying to think what what is what is going on how do I understand it but also watching much much more sort of easy to understand I suppose something like how tasty was my little Frenchman watching how tasty was my little Frenchman which is an inversion of, of the Tarzan myth I suppose in a way and at the end of it feeling really uncomfortable at the ending which an indigenous woman looks at the camera and eats a white man I'm feeling really uncomfortable and having to come to terms with the fact that I felt really uncomfortable and then getting past that and starting to laugh at myself and feeling uncomfortable how ridiculous that is. It's the inversion of Tarzan, isn't it? Um, and then feeling that, oh yes, that this is something that I should really be writing about. Um, what is going on in these films where something stares back at you that makes you feel uncomfortable. And a lot of the work on um, the direct gaze back at the viewer, uh, there's a lot in, in feminist scholarship, of course, but typically we didn't tend to look at the post-colonial or the animal. We tended to look more at um, just white people, I suppose, thinking about thinking about that. So what informs was the films with a lot of Latin American thinking. The lost past, what am I trying to get at? Right, one of the questions that I've had to come up with an answer to uh, is what's the difference between what I'm saying and, and what Miriam Hirsch was saying? And ultimately there are differences, like it's not just second generation. I mean, look, Wang in, in Though I'm Gone is the same generation. It's not just, but that's just like nitpicking. It's still the reconstruction of a past, isn't it, David? It is in these ones because it's the documentaries and they are like, you know, Los Rubios could be one of the films that I'm talking about, even though you could really describe it with Miriam Hirsch and it has been done very well. Um, so it's not that, but if you look at the other films, the sim a very similar thing is happening, but you can't describe it with Miriam Hirsch. Why is it that Uncle Boonie or uh, How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman can sit alongside these films if you've got a Deleuzean aesthetics and they're all doing the similar thing about this lost past. Um, when I say lost past then, yes, all pasts are lost, but we have narratives that memorialize or, or tell those stories that preserve them, don't they? Over and over again, the repetition of the same, however you want to think about that. These are the pasts that are meant to be lost in the crack. So in a Deleuzean head, these are the, these are the repetitions of difference, which we're not supposed to acknowledge, because if we do, then they'll cause everything to rupture and it'll all be, uh, it'll all be frightening for us all to lose that certainty. So that's what I mean. And in those films, you see that. So in the documentaries, you'd see it in a way that you could explain with post-memory. Oh yeah, it's that kind of um, foregrounded act of reconstruction is happening that foregrounded engagement with what's going on. It's a lost past, it's not here, have you noticed? But it's happening in the other films, that same thing in different, in different ways. Um, moments of revelation are shown as moments of revelation in a film like uh, Embrace of the Serpent, where the, the white explorer has his kind of road to Damascus discovery. It's shown as a road to Damascus discovery that he cannot understand the indigenous other. He has a big revelation that, that shows a different cosmology what does he really learn and is I can't understand that. 
Um, so these are paths that are meant to be squashed down and lost, but cinema tries to show that impossibility. So that I think is a, probably a bit different from the essential lacuna that can never be filled. It's not quite the same, but somehow there is something there about an absence at the heart of it. Um, yeah, that's as, that's as much as I can do it. When, when you said, you know, about, you know, Auschwitz and so on, what, what came to mind immediately was something a bit different, which is about colonial modernity, which is when we, when we think about the impossibility of representation and we go to Auschwitz, um, I, I think I always end up thinking about Charles Mills again, saying, um, you know, this wasn't, you know, this wasn't new. This was something that had happened in a lot of other places. So for us to say, oh, we can't possibly, we can comprehend what happened it's not just the technological either you know this idea that came through in the history on film debate oh it's because it's something to do with the technological nature of modernity but if you think about it with colonial modernity it's actually been going on for a long time um so it's it's not that we can't assimilate it is that do we want to really assimilate what it means about uh eurocentrism sorry michael long answer <laughs> no that was great thank you <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think, Guido, if you have a short question, I'm mindful <laughs> of the time, so, you know, it's like a, a short yeah, question too. Okay. I will, I will phrase it in the most short way I am able to do. So basically, I would just would like to know your opinion a bit about the relationship between explicit language and implicit language, in the sense that this is something I've been working on as well. And... Uh, like for example, if I think about my expertise on Italian literature, the ideas of uh, implication, the focus on the perpetrators, they were all stuff that were implicit in many works of art, in, in my case, uh, novels and literary texts. And then I, through the years, they became more explicit. So if by studying this trajectory, I kind of see this as a kind of positive and welcome development. But now, you know, while listening to you, I, I kind of see as a kind of uh, uh, defense, you know, of uh, the implicit uh, communication, you know, and, and, and the form of implicit, implicit knowledge that art and cinema can, uh, uh, can develop. And so the way in which then push us to, to think about it. So if, I, if you could briefly develop oh. on, on this relationship. How long have I got, Diana? 30 seconds. Up, up to you. <laughs> Easy, no problem. Uh, no, um, I think that with, with all uh, respect to context of China, uh, it's, it's, a different, um, it's a different political system and what you are able to say is, is going to lead to very different forms of, of expression. So, yeah, I, I think in terms of if, if you're talking about that from countries leaving dictatorships and transitioning to democracy, maybe, I expect you probably see a gradual opening up, don't you, especially as generations die. And then you get truth commissions or you don't, depends on the country. And, and then probably, yeah, you get a more explicit address. I suppose what concerns me more is whether we're in a, that's quite a nice Darwinian trajectory, isn't it? Things will evolve. Uh, whether we're in that or whether we're in cycles. Pepe Mujica, you know, he went through all that and then he became the president of Uruguay for a very long time. But now the, the system is, is shifting again. And what is going to happen in Latin America next? I, you know, we don't know. So it might be a bit of that old uh, milieu hyper chaos. And what you think is, is normal. You think there are laws. You think there are the rules of physics. And then suddenly everything around you turns into, um, as a PhD student of mine said, vegetarian haggis. You know, because the, the rule was always there, but you just haven't realized it long enough to realize that that was the rule. And maybe it's a, it's a form of cycling which is going to take us to, as you can tell from this, I don't have a lot of, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about what's going on. So maybe we're going to darker places again. I'm, I'm not really sure. I very much hope not, but I, I feel I am. So in answer to your question, my question would be trajectory or cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um... Um, we are on time, so unless anybody has some urgent question, then, then I'm happy to end our keynote here by thanking very much David again, round of applause, thank you, and uh, for thanking everyone for being here and for joining us today, for sharing your questions with us. And we're looking forward to having you back uh, for the symposium on May 19th and 20th. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, guys. Thank you. <laughs>